to this day and what he did to you in the, in the, in the wilderness until you came to this place, uh, what he had did to, to Dathan and to Abiram and the sons of Eliab and the son of Reuben, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households, their tents, and every living thing that followed them in the midst of all Israel. For your eyes have seen all the great work of the Lord that he did. Jumping to 18, it says, You shall therefore lay these words of mine in your heart and in your soul. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand that they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking to them when you're sitting in your house and when you're walking by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates that, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land of the Lord, swore to your fathers to give them. May the Lord have blessing to the reading of this word. Uh, let's pray again. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, for a special time where we could celebrate Father's Day, but definitely remember who you are. I pray that you would be the one to speak through me because there's not enough good in me to do this on my own. I pray that even if we go through text that we think is uh, overused, we remember that your word is alive, that you breathe life into it the way you breathe life into us. And that being the case, there's no end to what we can know about you. There's no end to the joy we can find in you. So I pray that you would do with us as you wish, that you would work within us so that you can then work through us. We thank you. We love you. All this we pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So Father's Day is a, is a funny one for me. And it's funny for me because as I was having conversations this morning, I don't know about any of you, but Father's Day is just not something I thought about growing up because it just had nothing to do with me. And I don't know if I was a special case because whether you know this about me or not, I'll let you know. I, I grew up really punk rock as a teenager. And if my parents were here, they would sigh in embarrassment because it was, it was rough, guys. You, you hear of like ugly duckling syndrome, that was me as a teenager. Or, and I didn't even know it. I thought I was awesome, I gotta be honest. I would walk around with giant chains on my neck. I painted specific nails on my hands black. Um, I, I spiked my hair as high as I could. And portions of my hair, I would dye blue or red. And other than that, I was growing really anti-establishment, anti-authority. And as somebody who glamorized this punk rock ethos, you do a lot of this um, rebellion more because you're, you want to live in the now. And when you grow unsatisfied with the culture around you, you kind of realize when you can't do anything to change the world, rebellion and chaos sometimes seems to fit in your limited understanding. So this is how I grew up. And the truth is, no punk thinks about growing up one day. Because in a lot of ways, punks were never meant to grow up. So there's this documentary that I watched a couple years ago that addresses just that. What happens when punks grow up? Knowing that punks are really consumed with things like anarchy and chaos and destruction. If you know any punks, you will probably know that they're also infatuated with profanity, particularly the F word. So this one documentary spins it on its head. It refers to this documentary as the other F word. Meaning, what happens when punks grow up and become dads? The other F word being fatherhood. And all of a sudden you see these old, former punks, maybe still current punks, going through these moments of self-reflection where they wonder, how does everything change when we become fathers? All of a sudden you think, okay, in reflection, looking back, these, uh, these guys are like, maybe I shouldn't have tattooed my forehead. Stuff like that. Um, I'm going to have to go through similar things as well. You know, I'm going to have to have conversations with my two daughters when they grow up in terms of tattoos and stuff because I'm not going to be exempt from that question. That's just the truth. Um, and I'm not going to be able to tell them no because that would be hypocritical of me. And so we, there was also these guys in these documentaries who were either punk musicians or part of like the like rock and roll and skate communities where they would look back and look at, at the rebellion and they would say a lot of it was very much in large part due to the fact that they had absent parents. 
They're either products of, of parents who left, parents who got divorced, or they're products of parents who were, though physically present, were not really a part of their lives. So we think about that. And these punks become dads one day, and they, their tone changes completely. Some of them say very specific things. The bassist of the Red Hot Chili Peppers says, I'm not one of those parents and goes to, goes to my kids and says, I gave you life, you should respect me. And he pretty much goes, the truth is, they gave me life. So he thinks about the fact where sometimes as parents, we may be tempted to think about the lives we would have had if we didn't have kids. And he pretty much admits that my life before this was probably lost. And somehow God uses children to teach us how to be functioning, contributing adults because children bring us new life in a lot of ways. So again, if we look at this from a Christian perspective, one of the things that we think about is what is this idea of fatherhood? One of the biggest realizations that a couple of these former punks had in this documentary was when we thought we would change the world when we were younger, we were abrasive, we were brash, and we were headstrong and fairly nihilistic. And they come to this realization, and this one said was key. They said, maybe the way that we change the world is by raising a better generation of kids. So when we think about this, I hope that we can, I can encourage all of us. And if it's okay, I hope to give some specific encouragement to the dads in this room. But we need to know that fatherhood is not something that we can just happen to be a part of. We need to know that fatherhood is a calling, it is a responsibility, and it's one that we may not have been ready for. Because as much as we try to plan to have kids, some people have kids without planning them. Other times we plan to, uh, to have kids and it's just something else that we never could have imagined. But even with that, I want to remind us that in a lot of ways, our willingness to keep growing as fathers will trump our readiness that we thought we had before. So if you're willing to keep growing, if you're willing to keep seeking God and how he's equipping us to be the dads he calls us to be, uh, let's keep moving in this. The first thing I need us to realize is that as dads, we have a calling to be the primary disciplers of our family. I'm going to say that again. If you are a dad, you are the primary discipler in your family. If you could open up with me, open up to the book of Proverbs 22. It's a good go-to verse. Proverbs 22 verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go. And I think this is interesting uh, word usage here, because if you grew up studying grammar... You'd read this sentence and you'd realize that there is, it seems like there's no subject in this sentence. It starts with, with a verb and a command. But we know that if it starts with a verb and a command, the subject is you. You train a child in the way he should go. As dads, as parents, this is our role. You train. This is your role. Don't shy away. I know it gets hard and I've seen... Having done youth ministry, I've seen uh, parents shy away from this responsibility because a lot of times the generational gap between parents and kids, particularly parents and teenagers, just feels like it's too much to handle. I remember having times as a youth pastor where, where parents would come up to me frustrated and be like, Pastor AJ, you need to talk to my kid. And I'd be like, bro, like, I see your kid max five hours a week. Maybe you need to talk to your kid. And that was tough. Because I understand that kids can be problems, but realize that kids are craving presence and intimacy with their parents. Even when they think that it seems like your kids are just aliens and they think that they're smarter than you, the truth is they, they need you around. And they could feel when you're passing them off to somebody else. If I'm spending a max of five hours a week with your teenage kids, I'm hoping that we as parents would spend more. Because here's the thing, if we're not, if we're not the ones who are the primary disciples of our kids, 
we risk them being discipled by someone else. Let's not take that chance. Now, let's not take the chance of letting our kids being discipled by their peers and the, and, the, and the world outside when we should be the ones doing it. We should be the ones handling it. It says, Scripture says, this is your call. You train your kids in the way they should go so that as they grow up, they don't depart from sound doctrine and the sound way to live because really there are only two ways to live. There is the way of wisdom and of life and there is the way of foolishness and of death. Train them which way they should go. Develop them uh, to have a Christ-centered worldview by which they see the world, because if not, the other will happen. If we don't develop strictly biblical worldviews, what we end up developing is, is, is worldly worldviews. And all of a sudden, it's by that lens that they see Scripture. It's by that lens that they decide to see the church, when really it should be the other way around. Let us invest in our kids and let, let us invest in their biblical, Christ-centered worldview so that from this, they would see other people and see how when things don't add up, they know what is true. They know what God's view on things would be. And from there, they would wonder what's right and what's wrong and how to properly love those around them. This is your call. Your primary disciple. Realize that as the primary discipler, one of the things that we're called to do as parents, one of the things that we're called to do as dads is to cultivate and shape the potential of our kids. We're not called to just keep them on the ground, but we are called to, so that we can encourage them to, to dream big and have aspirations, but also discipline them in a way that they keep moving forward. And that's what we need to remember as well. As the primary disciplers in our families, discipline is, is discipleship. We need to train them, and part of training them properly is going to be disciplining our kids. There is never an instance where you're called to, to let kids do just anything they want to do. Because in a lot of ways, we, because we are fallen, we are prone to wander. But disciplining and shepherding our kids is how they continue to grow. Discipline them and teach them self-discipline. Like we said, th this is our role as parents. There's a beautiful story I read about, uh, about Charles Spurgeon. If you're not familiar with him, he was known as like the, the prince of preaching. And in his eulogy, his wife talked about how after dinner, he would call his wife and his kids into his study and he would lead them in, in scripture and in devotions. And I remember what that was like with my dad. I remember dreading this with my dad because I swore for some reason if it was between my mom and my dad, my mom would read like one page out of Daily Bread and my dad would read like eight chapters out of Psalms for some reason. And then I would fall asleep when he would pray and I would get in trouble and he'd be like, all right, we've got to read again because you weren't listening. But it stuck. Looking back, I saw how the Holy Spirit was, le was letting me ingest Scripture and he would refer to things uh, when appropriate. But other than that, it instilled in me the discipline to do my devos now as an adult. And if my dad wasn't disciplined enough to do family devotions with us, I can't imagine how much harder it would be for me as an adult to do this myself. Be the primary discipler. Don't shy away from it. Don't pass this calling on somebody else. Be the, be the one who is raising your kids because you know that they're your kids and not anybody else. So realize that this calling is yours. Realize that another calling we have as parents and as dads is to model Christ. You need to know that you are the first reflection of Christ that your child is ever going to witness. You're the first reflection of Christ that your child is ever going to see. Uh, and that is going to be for better or for worse. For no matter what, they're going to see you. So with that in mind, don't take your walk lightly. Know that every way you live, our kids are watching. And as we model Christ, one of the things that I also know is that if we don't have perfect dads, we have a perfect Heavenly Father. So no matter what kind of baggage you have from your fathers, know that you have a heavenly father who's built you up so you could be a better example for your kids. 
a good friend of mine comes from a broken home. And he told me that one time he was visiting his dad in Florida. And as he was visiting his dad, his, uh, he pulls him aside and he says, Hey, just letting you know, um, I'm, I'm going to go on a date with this woman. But she doesn't know that I have a kid. So when you're around me and she's around, I need you to refer to me as Uncle Bill. And then at the time, he thought it was like this cool joke between him and his dad. So they'd be out and uh, this wouldn't be there and she'd be asking about him. And then he was like, yeah, dad, I mean, Uncle Bill. And at the time, he thought it was like this cute inside joke, only to feel the weight of those conversations as, as an early adult where he said, in these moments, my dad was basically saying, you are not my son. And I would rather have, and I don't want anybody to know that you 